thanks for inviting me. Um, I often speak about my, my scientific research to geoscience folks, and so I spend a lot of time explaining what synchrotrons are and a, a lot of time avoiding showing uh, what my spouse likes to call wiggly lines. Um, but in this case, uh, it seems like one of the things that we sh all share is the use of X-ray absorption spectroscopy. So that's a cool opportunity for me to turn it around and talk a little bit more about um, how we do the geoscience side of our work. So I'm gonna talk about deep sea hydrothermal venting today. Um, this is a subject that I've been interested in for many years now and have been enjoying and it just keeps getting more interesting and um, richer all of the time. So the world's a heavy place these days, and so I thought I'd keep the plan light. We're going to talk a little bit about who the Earth and environmental scientists are at the synchrotrons, since we're not all in that um, category of disciplines. Although scanning the names, there are, of course, some of you very well uh, versed in this area. I'm going to talk a little bit about why iron is important in the ocean. I'm going to show you, this is more like a photo journal, I'm going to show you um, how we do our research of um, iron speciation in deep ocean settings. And then I'm going to tell you a little story about when bulk iron XF saved the day in terms of our science. Good old friend. Okay, so the earth and environmental science users uh, tend to be a fairly small percentage of the overall users at the North American um, synchrotron facilities, although the Canadian light source is an exception in that regard. Um, we are a small but diverse use of um, group of users um, with about 100 disciplines and subdisciplines falling under that category. And today, if we start to drill down into the disciplinary areas of my research, we're going to be thinking about the hydrosphere, we're going to be in that multidisciplinary um, field of oceanography, and I would say probably the iron work that I'm going to talk about falls best under ocean biogeochemistry research. Synchrotrons turn out to be really great analytical tools for biogeochemists interested in metals. This should come as no surprise to you. But I just wanted to give you a quick overview of what are the, you know, the characteristics of the materials that we study and why synchrotron tools tend to be so powerful. Uh, so earth materials, of course, are complex and heterogeneous and solid state chemistry is really important in a lot of systems. And there's three things I wanted to highlight. Um, I've had the pleasure of interacting with some of you in the past year. So you've seen me uh, say these things before, but there's three things that I like to think about that pair up well between synchrotron users and biogeochemists. And in part, the elements that we like to investigate, um, their chemical speciation, the processes that result in cycling in the environment, span the soft, tender, and hard X-ray regimes, all of which are available to us at modern synchrotrons. We also need to be thinking about multiple spatial scales. So oftentimes microorganisms are the biogeochemical drivers of a lot of processes we're interested in, but we need to be able to think about those processes carried out at the nano and micro scale, at the scale of our field sites, all the way up to uh, the globe. So being able to access multiple spatial scales is something that synchrotrons allow us to do with our samples. And we need to be able to query multiple properties of materials. So the, there, this is not anywhere near a complete list, but my group tends to do a lot of imaging, um, X-ray diffraction within that scattering bin, and then a lot of X-ray absorption spectroscopy, which is mostly what I'm going to talk to you about today. So I think of this as a science highlight. Jerry said that typically y'all are doing about 30 minutes of science content delivery and then um, hopefully a lot of discussion. So I'm thinking of this as like a little cameo for how XF spectroscopy um, at the Iron 1S or K edge turned out to be really important for a paper that we just published this year looking at the speciation of particulate iron. And 
that speciation piece is sandwiched at the bottom of my slide right between transport and bioavailability. So it's a really important characteristic of the materials that we wanted to understand um, for the deep ocean. So here's how the story is going to go. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, why iron is important in the ocean and I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, photography, really nice photos of our uh, field work. And then I'm going to have a break for questions just about that sort of science context. So that's kind of the, the rhythm that I'm going for. So you're looking at a photograph of Colleen Hoffman. She's a recent PhD graduate of my group. Some of you may have met her. She uh, identifies as a marine chemist. And the person on the right, Caroline, she's a younger current PhD student in my group. And I like to tell this story uh, from the perspective of Colleen. She's the first author of the paper that I'm highlighting. And it's, you know, one dissertation funded by one NSF grant, um, where work at three North American synchrotron facilities was carried out at five beam lines. So the student got around a lot in terms of the analytical approaches that she was using. Um, in order to do this work, Another member of our group spent 60 days at sea, collecting over 300 samples. And the area of the Pacific Ocean that we're going to talk about is a transect that spans 7,000 kilometers. So this was a tough project to do where synchrotron tools were the um, highlight, but I think ultimately we've been successful and it's a great, uh, it's a great paper, I think, that I'll be telling you about. So we care about iron in the ocean because by, from a biogeochemical point of view, it is the handshake between um, a metal that is limiting to uh, phytoplankton growth in the photic zone of the ocean for about one third of the globe. So this is a process that's big and important over a large portion of our um, planet. And what these phytoplankton do that is so interesting is that, of course, they are going to be taking CO2, turning it into biomass. And so it's the handshake between the global carbon cycle, CO2 in the atmosphere, in the past, present, and future, thinking about climate. So iron in the ocean is really important um, because of that, those coupled biogeochemical cycles between iron and carbon. There's lots of other reasons to care too, but if you step way back, that's the big big reason in my view. And there's a lot of sources of iron to the ocean. It is of course a limiting nutrient, as I said, in one third of the upper water column for those phytoplankton. But there are sources of iron to the ocean. Uh, when I started doing this work, the hydrothermal source that I'm going to tell you about today was considered a controversial source. That is no longer really true. Um, but hydrothermal venting is a globally distributed phenomenon. It's um, all of these little red and yellow um, symbols that you see are locations where hydrothermal venting has been observed or confirmed. And they're basically, it's a volcanic mountain range at the bottom of the ocean where seawater interacts with rocks, gets loaded up with iron, other metals, becomes anoxic and is revented at the bottom of the, um, at the ocean floor. Other sources of iron to the ocean are the continents. So dust, runoff, um, and then there's some internal processing also that's interesting, but we don't have time to go into that today. So the reason why that hydrothermal source was controversial um, at the beginning of these, this research project was because you've got your iron poor seawater, this is highly schematic, uh, iron poor seawater circulating into the fractured crust. It's becoming heated, it's interacting with rocks. And when it's revented at the seafloor, all of that iron was thought to precipitate out either as sulfide, marine, um, sulfide bearing minerals or then to, or to oxidize to iron three and precipitate out as iron three bearing minerals. And the thought at the time was that this process was uh, very completely stripping the iron out and so the hydrothermal source could be neglected. We did know already for a long time that other hydrothermally derived products like helium, uh, which acts as a conservative tracer from hydrothermal venting can indeed travel great distances. 
Um, so this is just a map showing here's North and South America. Um, we could talk about this figure for a while, but the main point is wherever you see the orange and yellow, those are contours showing a hydrothermally derived helium signal. So many thousands of kilometers of travel of hydrothermal um, really re released materials. But what about iron, right? We want to know if iron can get from a hydrothermal vent site and stay suspended in the water column long enough to matter for these larger ocean by geochemical cycles. Okay, so that brings us to an opportunity. This is the um, GeoTraces program that's funding all of these lines, these red and yellow lines, um, are transects designed to uh, investigate really important oceanographic processes around the globe. And where I just put that oval dashed line here is the transect that we're going to talk about today because it goes right over that great big hydrothermal helium source that we just looked at. If we zoom in a little bit, you'll see on the right hand side of the map, that's the coast of South America. And this is the transect that um, Colleen's work comes from. I'm going to show you, I don't want you to have to memorize a bunch of numbers, but what I just want you to uh, realize is that the hydrothermal source, the Mid-Ocean Ridge Spreading Renter Center, is here at 18, Station 18. But we're going from the coast of Peru out to Tahiti, is the part of the Pacific Ocean that is relevant today. So we have a lot of um, interesting challenges getting our samples. So if you want to get particles out of water in the deep ocean, you have quite a few options. And over the years, my group has used uh, all of these. But just let me give you a real brief overview. We'll start on the right-hand side of the slide and move to the left. We can use um, remotely or human-operated vehicles to do um, in situ filtration, for example. You can also use cables off of the ship to um, send down uh, bottles and filtration devices that can be triggered remotely, something like this on deck. That's me with my collaborator, Greg Dick, and we've got a rosette of bottles here. And underneath, you've got some in situ filtration equipment built by my collaborator, Chip Breyer. But we can also use seafloor moorings. So for example, we can get descending particles in sediment traps. That's what a sediment trap looks like on deck. We can also put down moorings where time resolved filtration or other kinds of events are collected. Uh, for example, this one. So for today, the samples I'm going to talk about were collected by um, putting eight cabled um, in situ pumps and doing a full water column um, filtration event. I'll show you some pictures of that. So before we can even do any of that, you have to pack up and ship most of your laboratory um, to port. So here are some folks from my group packing for that trip. Um, when your materials get out to port here, this is Seattle. Um, they have to be then <laughs> craned on to the ship. Um, this was a 60 day cruise with a really big science team. And so they would not allow us to bring enough gas cylinders to run our anaerobic chamber. So what's being um, craned on right now is the nitrogen generator that I bought just for this cruise. And it worked, which was great. Uh, once you get all of your equipment and crates onto the ship, then you basically populate these laboratories. They're dusty, they're rusty. If you wanna study nanomolar concentrations of iron in the ocean, there's some things that need to be addressed. Uh, but what you can see on the bench here in an early part of the setup is our anaerobic, our koi anaerobic glove bag. Note that it's uh, secured to the ceiling and the table. So if the seas get rough, things won't jump off. And this box here, this aluminum box is really important. Uh, this is a HEPA filter box, and this is how we pull particles out of air um, in our workspaces. And we basically build a big plastic bubble around our workspace. Uh, that's what the constructed bubble looks like. Ships air is pulled in through the HEPA filters, and then you've got positive pressure in this, what we call a self-built HEPA 
So our samples were handled in a HEPA bubble in an anaerobic chamber. It was, it felt pretty epic at the time. <laughs> and this is Sarah Nicholas. Some of you might know her. Uh, she's now a beamline scientist at NSLS2 on the hard X-ray microprobe beamline. Right now, she's in this photograph uh, setting up the interior of the koi glove bag before we sealed it up. Um, note that everything in the glove bag also had to be tied down. Um, so pumps and fan boxes and everything. So it was quite, uh, quite the setup. Very, very cool study though, a um, lot of work. So the materials went on to the ship in Seattle. Here's Minnesota, right? North Central um, Continental US, just in case you're wondering where I am right now. Um, ship left Seattle and transited down to um, Ecuador where the science crew then met, met the ship when it arrived. And then after the crew, the science crew joined the ship down the coast of Peru, and then the transect began. So there's an upwelling zone here, um, an oxygen minimum zone. Um, that's a very oceanographically interesting area. Um, and as you transect out across the hydrothermal vent area, that's where I'm interested. And the final um, port was in Tahiti. So shipboard, the filtration devices that we use, there's eight of them, they're dual head filters. And this is a hangar bay right on the deck of the ship. You can kind of see here a full, they're like cylindrical. And those were deployed on a cable. Here's Dan, Dan Onimus, um, who's now an assistant professor. Deploying them, you'll notice there's two filter heads now on each of the, these pumps. Um, there was, I think ultimately, I want to say four different filters that were collected um, during this in situ filtration time at discrete depths uh, in the ocean. And here's Dan. So GeoTraces is a highly integrated um, scientific program. And so here Dan is basically cutting, it looks like a little piece of pizza, right? He's cutting the filters into these wedges and then many scientists receive splits of these. Um, our samples tended to be um, handled almost exclusively under a nitrogen headspace, and here Sarah's bringing in some filter samples uh, to basically document them, package them up for the long ship home, and the long wait for beam time. So that's, that's the motivation for the work. That's how we get our samples, and I wanted to just stop here. Um, and ask if there was any questions. A few questions and people should keep typing them into chat. Um, first, you mentioned that iron is the limiting, uh, limiting nutrient limiting mineral uh, for about 30% of the, uh, the um, phytoplankton for the upper ocean. What are the other limiting minerals? Oh yeah, so there's a lot of important um, micronutrients that are of interest to people, some folks even here on the call but when you think about the enzymes that the organisms need to run to bring in nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon, we need to be thinking about zinc is an important one. Um, I think also nickel and copper are important, and they can be co, I believe there are places in the surface ocean where they can be co-limiting with other, other transition metals. See, okay. Um, so uh, you mentioned there were, uh, a very interdisciplinary team was out for the trip on this transect. What were some of the other studies that were being done where synchrotron work could play a role? Oh yeah, there was, um, there, so they were, the goal of the team was to try to measure essentially all relevant trace elements and isotopes. So they really ran the periodic table of, um, elements of interest and analytical tools to address those. But there were several other um, scientists that were interested in imaging microorganisms and their internal distribution of elements. And so that is a hard X-ray nanoprobe like fluorescence observation, Ben Twining um, and his group. And then I feel like there were a lot of um, methods that used solid state filters like um, 
like a manganese oxide filter to scavenge thorium, for example, out of seawater. And it all, I feel like there's probably more applications than just our two groups um, in terms of thinking about synchrotron tools. But the main problem, of course, is how dilute the system is. So Got that's the big, it's the big analytical challenge. Got it. Um, uh, another question is, uh, where does the funding come from? Uh, where does the funding come from? And what's the, the funding cycle like for this kind of very interdisciplinary uh, geoscience work? Yeah, so this work, the work that I had, the grant, came from the National Science Foundation. And these geotraces cruises um, are planned very far in advance, many, many years, in terms of building the scientific um, argument, in terms of funding the crews specifically by the chief scientists. And then there's a whole family or community of individual smaller proposals like the one that I got, you know, talking $300,000 or something for three years. And so there's scores of those that then get funded. Um, but I think the, the main thing that I found is that the community is interested in bringing in new perspectives, but you do have to play along in the sense that like joining all the planning workshops and being involved um, over many years, so. Very good. Uh, Alessandra, I see you have your hand up. You must have a question. Yeah, I, I have a question. I just, I'm so impressed by the magnitude of this operation and with, with an operation of this magnitude, you must have some pretty serious troubleshooting to do at times. So I was just wondering, I mean, the blooper reel must be quite something, but I was wondering if you could give us an example of uh, something that you had to troubleshoot shipboard or uh, some kind of problem that you had to solve. Yeah, it's a really good point because once you leave port, uh, they will only go back in for a medical emergency. So you do definitely, for example, people are well known <laughs> to pack multiple espresso machines, just as a sort of trivial thing. But if it's really important to you that you've got coffee, good coffee, you need to bring extra. Um, so I think we were very fortunate. We um, I think probably the two months before the, we shipped our stuff out to port, I had my entire research team working full time on prepping for the cruise. It was a lot of work. Um, and I would say ultimately almost everything we attempted worked. So I would say that, you know, worrying a lot up front definitely made things easier. Although, I did hear on the cruise that there were some opportunities unanticipated to try to get surface sediments. So this is a water column study, right? And the fact that um, the deep ocean was being included was sort of novel. And at some point, someone decided that they wanted to try to get some basalt chips or a little bit of sediment from the seafloor. And so they designed this like steel sinker ball and coated it with wax. I don't know how they found this. And then they would just drop it <laughs> at the bottom of one of the other cables. So there was some, I would say, duct tape science going on for sure, um, in addition to the plan science. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, you should continue, Brandy. Okay. Let me move all you yeah, over to the side here. Okay. So let's go back a little bit to the science questions. So we were interested in understanding whether hydrothermally de derived iron could be transported off axis in any way that was meaningful for the larger ocean. And if it was, we had evidence that it was. So we were already anticipating that we would like to understand the chemical speciation of that iron. My job was to look at the solid state chemistry. There were many others that were measuring dissolved iron, iron bound to organic ligands, those kinds of things. And then ultimately, putting all of it together, we really want to understand whether the iron that's leaving these hydrothermal systems ultimately gets involved in any sort of biological processes or cycling. So there's the science. And I just want to give you a couple 
quick answers to some of those questions. One of the first papers that came out of this cruise uh, by Joe Riesing and company at, in 2015 found that indeed the dissolved, I'm using air quotes, I'll explain that in a moment, the dissolved iron fraction was transportable from the hydrothermal system over many thousands of kilometers. So you've seen already from me this transect. Remember the hydrothermal system is here at station 18 showing you a side profile of the dissolved iron concentration here in this rainbow kind of heat map. So there's 18, that's the ridge axis, and then there's this plume uh, emanating from that site, 4,000 kilometers, it was detectable. Um, this was a big enough deal that this paper went to nature. Uh, everyone was very excited. Keeping in mind dissolved, from an oceanographic point of view means anything that passed through a 0.2 micron filter. So for those of you out there that like to study nanoparticles, nanoscale things, um, of course, we know that probably some of that iron is also in the solid, just to keep that in mind. A couple of years later, we published a paper. Um, my group was involved with this one. Um, and this one went to Nature Geoscience, so it still felt like kind of a big deal, um, but that the particulate iron coming from station 18, again, this is the hydrothermal vent, here's the plume moving off axis, also traveled many thousands of kilometers off axis. And so these, again, with the air quotes, this is an operationally defined size class, anything captured by a 0.2 micron filter. And so we were able to, with the help of our collaborators and our own work, establish that, yes, the transport potential for these materials is no longer a question. Um, there are interesting questions about how one would model it, how one would try to come up with flux estimates, but the transport potential is, is now, um, I would say, a solved question. So let's move on to the solid phase speciation, which is, I've made you want to see the spectroscopy, um, and that's where this comes in. So I'm gonna show you X-ray absorb or XFs. You don't even need to define it for this group. It's so much fun. Um, I'm going to show you XFs data that were collected from filters where we're targeting the iron speciation. And just this little schematic here on the left is just to keep you oriented. The um, left to right, east to west um, axis is going to move a little bit. And so I don't want you to worry too much about that. Um, but just keep in mind that Station 18 is where the hydrothermal venting occurs. It's essentially our zero distance. And then we're tracking um, the samples as they move off axis. So this is a figure, oh, I didn't put, this is a figure from Colleen's dissertation, also now a paper from, um, that was just published in 2020 in the ACS journal, Earth and Space Chemistry. And what you're looking at at the top is station 18, 20, all the way to station 30. I've given you a rough scale bar, zero kilometers at station 18, moving off axis here. Station um, 28 is around 2000 kilometers off axis. This is chi k cubed plotting um, with an arbitrary offset. And what you see in the solid lines is microprobe data from the advanced light source, um, 1032. And then over plotted where it was also collected in dashed is data from the bulk beam line at the advanced photon source, um, 20 bending magnet. And so your spectroscopist, you're already looking for patterns as you move off axis, good for you. <laughs> um, you'll notice they're pretty similar, surprisingly similar. This was not expected by me or anybody else that I talked to, um, but there are some differences. But before I move on to the fitting of the data, I just wanted to let you know that um, we were really very surprised that um, the microprobe observations and the bulk observations were indistinguishable, indistinguishable within the noise. And what that told us is that we had a material that was chemically pretty uniform. Um, again, not something that I was expecting. And I think for those of us that study natural systems, it's a little um, surprising. But it was true. Uh, we demonstrated that to ourselves. So we fit these XFs data with linear combinations of reference materials. Um, 
what I'm going to show you is a plot of that describes some of that speciation. So on the y-axis here, I'm showing the atom percent iron-3 in the form of an oxyhydroxide. So you'll notice that gum, it's right up at 100%. So these are iron-3 oxyhydroxides. And on the x-axis, you can track out the distance um, from the hydrothermal source. You'll see that the iron-3 oxyhydroxide content starts to turn over somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500 uh, kilometers off axis and crashes out here. And there's your, in case you're tracking the station locations, that's there for you. But let's take a look at this box. Um, it's a very oxidized plume from the particulate iron point of view. And if you go in and take a look at which of the iron species these data we're asking for in the linear combination fitting, it's something that we call our biogenic iron 3 oxyhydroxide standard. Um, I'm gonna, I have slides to come back to this and describe it, um, time permitting, interest permitting. But for now, just hold on to that idea. Um, as we move away from the axis, say from station 26 to 28, as we move outside of this little zone, um, we start to see a pretty big change in the particulate iron speciation. There's still a lot of iron-3. It's in the form of a two-line ferry hydrate-like material, but then we also have hornblende, which is a primary silicate, um, probably a continental source. So it looks like we may have lost the plume at this point, the hydrothermally derived particulate iron. And then as we move out to station 30, uh, it just becomes even clearer that we've got another source of particulate iron contributing to the water column, very likely no longer our original hydrothermal source. So a couple of things. Um, it was surprising to us. I would say that what we saw here in terms of the iron speciation at, at the ridge axis and within about 100 kilometers wasn't too surprising. Um, we were anticipating that there would be an, some aging or ripening of those iron-3 bearing materials into more stable phases during transport, perhaps. Um, that is not what we observed. Um, it's always possible that some of that was going on and those were materials that filtered out, meaning settled out to the sediments. Um, but this was surprising also to see that the chemistry was so uniform over such a long distance of transport. So before I tell you about some of the gory details of you know, what is it about this biogenic iron oxyhydroxide that speaks to these um, hydrothermal particles so directly, I wanted to let you ask some questions if you're interested. Um, about the science that we did? Uh, we've got a few questions. Um, uh, Satish, uh, are you, uh, is, can you ask your question, please? There we go. Yeah, nice uh, exact data, Brandy. So the, the question I have is, um, you're seeing mostly iron-3 oxides and uh, hydroxide, so why you didn't see any traces of sulfide phases? Just curious. Yeah, that is the big question, and it, it's been um, it's been a bit of an issue for us because we were based on this being the East Pacific rise. Um, we were anticipating iron to sulfur ratios that would have resulted in a fair amount of iron sulfide mineral precipitation. Um, so even in that um, station eighteen sample which is very close to the ridge axis, we don't detect um, anything but trace iron sulfides in our samples. So there might be a few different things happening. It might be that the iron to sulfur ratio along that stretch of the mid-ocean ridge is um, low in sulfur at that location. Um, it is really variable along that. There's some nice old papers from the late 90s showing just like iron to sulfur ratios along um, that ridge axis, and it is pretty variable. So that's one thing. Um, 
the plume is really large. And so where, where and when we collected our samples, the estimated residence time is about a month. So even though we're right over the ridge axis, the sample, the particles have had time to interact with seawater, which has got a lot of dissolved oxygen. So could have been oxidized. Um, we could have a problem with our filter sizes, right? Maybe these are nanoscale materials, the iron sulfides, and they're not aggregating. I'm gonna show you an SEM image of how these oxides aggregate. Um, but I think overall, all the measurements that we've made, we looked really hard for iron sulfides. We found I mean, very- It's not uh, for iron sulfide. Did you see like zinc sulfide or copper sulfide or any other sulfides for that matter? None. Well, you have to keep in mind we were hunting hunting from iron's perspective, right? So, um, but usually um, when we're closer to vent sites, especially metal rich vents, um, we do, we can see the, the zinc and the copper and the nickel sulfides because there's iron impurities in them. So we can track them with iron and then x-ray diffraction. Um, there was a member of the research group um, on the cruise that was trying to measure acid volatile sulfides in complementary samples. And those also came up extremely low or non-detect. So we have some other analytical observations to suggest that the, the amount of sulfur is pretty low in that young plume. Okay, uh, Kevin Russo, you have a question? Yeah, Brandy, very interesting. Uh, as you might guess, I'm, I'm really interested in the um, speciation details of the iron. Um, the biogenic iron three, how is it distinct from two-line ferrihydride? Hmm. As okay. far as you, you know, yeah. Thank yeah, you. I think you should hold that question. I'm looking at, we have, I think we're doing okay on time. Um, I do have a few slides that uh, talk specifically about the characteristics of that material. The reference material, well, our samples. Okay, sounds great. A follow-on question is, is the iron-3 oxyhydroxide of, of iron sulfide heritage? In other words, iron sulfides of various kinds being emitted from the vent. Does it, does it undergo biogenic oxidation to this Fe3 oxyhydroxide? Yeah, so that's a good question. And I would say, there are um, some things I can say that are probably accurate, and then there's some speculation. <laughs> so what's coming out of the vents um, primarily should be aqueous iron two. Um, depending on the composition of the vent fluids, it might be a dissolved complex with chlorine or something like that, but it's, it's iron two plus. And when you go through the temperature change from the vent fluid to within half a meter of the top of the chimney or vent opening, um, the temperature quenches really fast. And so if there's sulfur there, you get the precipitation of iron sulfide minerals. Um, but that's why this ratio of iron to sulfur in the vent fluid matters so much for the ultimate speciation that we capture in that plume. So if you have a low sulfur plume, low sulfur vent fluids, then you're going to get a lot more iron-3 oxyhydroxide uh, formation. You've got dissolved oxygen from seawater interacting with the iron-2+, plus, oxidation, polymerization, you know, precipitation. Um, but if you have a goodly amount of sulfur, hydrogen sulfide, then you can get a burst of precipitation of sulfide minerals. So those are kind of the two end member cases. And then the folks have argued that um, pyrite and other things that might be, that are formed in the vents, when they're formed, um, you know, they might be stable in seawater for a while. And so whether those would, um, if they formed, would they um, oxidize very quickly to form an iron three oxyhydroxide? I think the answer on that is it depends. So I'm sorry that I can't, uh, Maybe we can have a separate discussion. <laughs> yeah, no, that helps a lot. Thank you. Okay. Oh, okay, there is also a question about whether the sulfur level at this particular vent was fairly typical of hydrothermal vents or if, or if it was anomalously low or anomalously high. 
Yeah, so you might be picking up on, especially from Satish's question, that we expected to find more sulfur in the precipitated materials. So that was a bit of a surprise. Um, and I would say, given the type of venting, this is a basalt hosted mid-ocean ridge spreading center, um, they have variable iron to sulfur ratios for sure. Um, but, you know, sites farther north from this location have a lot of sulfur. And we find that the, the solid phase chemistry in the plumes are really different from what I just reported to you um, here. Okay. Uh, last question for this, uh, Adam Hitchcock. Um, Okay. So this may actually be better uh, at the last part of the talk because uh, uh, we need, do need to see the iron uh, K edge uh, near edge spectra. But I was just wondering if you've uh, also got complementary iron 2P uh, studies because uh, I generally find them a little bit more chemically sensitive. But that's always point of discussion. Yeah, yeah. In fact, the um, X ray. Scan, so the Stixum, the scanning, transmission, x-ray, microscopy, and the iron 2P spectra that we got from that um, was the first paper that Colleen wrote. That came out in 2018, and it, it really focused uh, mostly on the fact that these materials were loaded with organic carbon. Um, we do have iron 2P data, but they were collected um, at ALS 5322 beamline, for those of you who are Stixum users. And, um, you know, it looks, it looks like very hydrate. <laughs> but, at, but in other sites where we have more diversity in the iron speciation, the 2P data have, have been very nice and very helpful. I agree, Adam. Okay, you should continue with the last part of the talk. Thanks, Brandon. Okay. I love this format. With the breaks in the middle, I think this is very good. Well, it's more fun for the speaker anyway. Okay. So what about this biogenic iron-3 oxyhydroxide? So it turns out that we were really lucky that we had this material in our database. And it was in our data reference database dating back to um, a paper that I published from my postdoc in 2009, so a while ago. But the sample origin itself is even earlier than that. Um, it comes from a paper written by my postdoctoral advisor in 2003. And what she did was she incubated sulfide minerals at the seafloor for a known period of time. And while that might just seem like a super obvious thing for, for one to do in this field, um, access to the seafloor, time resolve sampling and things can be challenging, but she pulled it off. And on the left-hand side, you're seeing a glass slide with some of these sulfide materials attached. Um, they've gone through a lot of oxidation and decay through their incubation process. And this on the right hand side is a scanning electron microscopy image. Note the scale bar, 10 micron. And these alteration products that formed over four months at the seafloor were iron microbial biofilms. So as part of my postdoc, I had written a NASA proposal to look for potential signatures of biogenicity in minerals that are created by microbes. So this was one of the samples that, that I worked on. And on the left here, I'm showing an image of one of those mineral chips after it was brought back um, from sea. There's a black dashed line showing the surface and this little thing that looks like a haystack. That's one of these biofilms that grew um, during the incubation time. Down here on the left-hand side, Matthew Marcus will recognize this image maybe. Um, we made petrographic thin sections through some of these biofilm areas. This is an X-ray fluorescence map from Beamline 1032, the advanced light source. 
Um, the main thing to notice is the white dashed line is again the surface of that mineral chip that was incubated at the seafloor. Here where you have the number one and this red puff of material, that's a biofilm. And so we attempted to do x-ray diffraction on the minerals in that biofilm. And you can see on the right hand side, there's little numbers showing that the diffractogram for um, spot number one is not very illuminating. Pretty typical of many biogenetic um, precipitates, uh, but we needed to check. Um, then we found ourselves grateful that XFS is a really great tool for looking at materials that have poor crystallinity. And so we used iron XFS to investigate this iron microbial biofilm. And we went all the way back to uh, Monceau and Dritz and their polyhedral approach to fitting XFS data and thinking about XFS data for these um, different iron oxyhydroxide minerals. So some of you might know this paper well, and I just grabbed what you're looking at now is um, a polyhedral representation of the mineral gertite on the left-hand side. It is an alpha iron 3 OOH um, polymorph. And it has some really, it's one, it's a really remarkable mineral in the sense that it's environmentally relevant and it's well behaved. So even if you synthesize um, nanoscale needles of this material, it's still going to give you good Bragg diffraction, like has good crystallinity, good behavior. So we love it as a reference material. Um, and so what I wanted to do was take that biogenic mineral um, from the seafloor. We did XFS on it at the microprobe beam line because it's just a tiny bit of material and put it in the context of a gold standard um, iron oxyhydroxide gertite. So on the left-hand side, you're looking at um, the gertite spectrum on the top and this biogenic signature on the bottom with six line and two line ferry hydrate standards in between. And then on the right panel, you're looking at uh, the Fourier transform, of course, um, showing the iron oxygen in their interatomic distances in the first shell. And gertite here creates that tall second shell. And there's three distinct iron iron interatomic distances in that second shell. To be able to model all three of those interatomic distances, you have to have pretty good data um, out to a K of 14. I mean, it depends on your perspective. It's quite hard for us to get really great data out to a K of 14. Um, but you want to you want to be out in that range so that you have enough spectral resolution to, to model the three iron iron interatomic distances in the second shell. And when we did that, well we when I did that, the royal we, um, it took two approaches. Uh, I, of course, made a simple shell-by-shell -shell model to um, fit the biogenic iron oxyhydroxide, but I also took the gertite um, pattern, modeled it, and then said, all right, if we think about these iron oxyhydroxides from the polyhedral approach, what happens if we take a simulated gertite spectrum and start removing or reducing the polyhedral linkages that we know are important for creating the spectral pattern that it generates. And so you can model sort of from the bottom or you can take it apart from the top. Um, but ultimately what we found is that the, the most consistent model for the biogenic minerals were these two dimensional sort of blebs of material, um, very little corner sharing in the polyhedral um, signatures, um, very um, consistent with edge sharing. And so what I have here is this, this little diagram on the right hand side sort of representing what the shell by shell model was that best fit um, the biogenic iron oxyhydroxide. So I think actually given the questions that we had maybe, um, what do you think Jerry, should I stop here and let folks ask if they have any questions about that. I think you should you should move through to the end. Finish it up. All right.
So bringing that back then to the big hydrothermal plume at the East Pacific rise, what we think is happening is the iron two is coming out of the vent. It's mixing with background seawater, which is oxygenated. And very likely there's a pretty rich um, ecosystem in that the vicinity because there's a lot of organic carbon um, that's being taken up by these materials as they precipitate. The XFs tells us that there's sort of these two dimensional um, materials that you really can't call them a mineral in a traditional sense, but that signature, we can track it from the vent field itself and follow it um, almost 2000 kilometers off axis. And this material appears to be stable. Um, it's not aging, ripening, reprecipitating into other more stable phases. One of the things then that we concluded from this study is that we thought we have some diagnostic features of hydrothermally derived particulate iron. And one of them has to do with morphology, which I've not emphasized up to this point, but I thought I'd show you because they're pretty fun. On the left-hand side is what the blank filter looks like. This is the polyether sulfone depth filter. Um, moving to the middle image, that's right it's an example. I mean, it, it was ubiquitous. Like everywhere on the filter, we had these large clusters, um, large meaning several micron in diameter, clusters of nanoparticles. These are the iron three oxyhydroxides from which the XFs that I showed you come from. And we can track that morphology out off axis. And we can also track the speciation of the material. So we have clusters of nanoparticles from a morphological point of view. The iron speciation, you know, it's, it's hard. We don't have a specific name for it. We could call it a short range ordered material. Um, we could call it, um, my postdoc advisor used to really favor this, the idea of a proto fairy hydrite. This is a material that would have formed fairy hydrite if it hadn't gotten gummed up with organic materials or some other process that capped reactive sites. Um, so we think of the chemical speciation then of the particulate iron as being a nanomineral, something that looked like it was going to become a fairy hydride, but because of coatings perhaps um, did not make it. And so I think to the best of our ability at this time, we've solved that solid phase speciation question. And now the big remaining question to be um, resolved is, so what, right? Do these materials get anywhere in the ocean um, where microbial processes might um, act upon them in a way that affects bioavailability and larger um, iron biogeochemical processes? But I would say the main thing I think that came out of this study is we now know what these materials are that are relevant for a really large swath of the Pacific Ocean. We can make these in the laboratory and these bioavailability kinds of questions can be tested in the field and they can be tested in the laboratory. So I think um, that's an exciting next step for our work. So I'll, just for kicks, I'll leave you with this picture of me in the um, human operated vehicle Alvin. I got to go to the East Pacific Rise 9 North area myself um, uh, last year. So that was very exciting. And funding over the years has primarily for this work come from the National Science Foundation. That's it. Thank you. A couple of questions. Uh, Peter Botts, you have a question? Yeah, um, thank you. It was really interesting. I, I have a question about, well, the hydrothermal vent plume that you uh, did excess on. Um, and you, in, in one of your samples, you identified green rust. We did. I was really surprised about that because it's a very unstable phase. Um, yeah. So I was wondering how certain you are. Uh, so I've got three questions about that. I'll state them immediately. So I was just wondering how certain you are that it is, in fact, green rust rather than something slightly more stable like magnetite. Um, where would you suggest that the green rust comes from, as in what's the source, and how come it's not oxidized? Yeah, okay. So I'm 
I'm glad that you saw that. Um, we think, based on a, a bunch of different um, observations from many other sources besides our own work, we think that the source of the iron, particular iron for that station is this um, plateau feature that's um, in the deep ocean. And so therefore, like the Montmorillonite, right, that's a phyllosilicate, secondary phyllosilicate, that one makes sense. Um, the green rust is a bit perplexing. Um, I think from an iron XF's point of view, we would be able to tell it apart from something like magnetite. But it could also be that, you know, the spectrum is essentially asking for some mixed valence character and what it pulled out uh, was the green rust standard. So we've not gone in and said, okay, can we verify that with X-ray diffraction? Can we verify that with um, maybe some characteristic particle morphology with SEM? So I would say it's intriguing. Um, I wouldn't hang my hat on it, but you know, sediments can have organic materials and certainly these samples were protected from oxidation after sampling. So if we should have been able to see mixed valence materials if they were there. Mm -hmm. We still have samples. <laughs> it would be really That's interesting. something to go back to. Yes, green rust is inherently difficult to work with. And I've had, I've worked with students that really need to be extremely careful that when doing X-ray diffraction on green rust, that they, mm. that it was absolutely no exposure to oxygen whatsoever. Otherwise they lost it. Yeah. All right, um, uh, just to, to jump to a couple more questions and then we need to, to end today. Um, Matthew Marcus, you had a question or a comment? Yeah, a couple of questions. Uh, you know, one, one of your earlier slides, you show the, uh, the plot of uh, you know, the particulate iron you know, versus location. And there's a blob right at the bottom at uh, station 32. And I was wondering if that, uh, where that comes from and uh, if that's connected with the plume. Yeah, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of features that I didn't talk about, and so probably what that is, is a, like a near seafloor sediment source. So I wouldn't be expected, um, I mean, while those sediments are definitely over millions of years accumulating from things that settle from the water column above, um, we wouldn't necessarily, we wouldn't expect that to be a hydrothermal uh, material. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, is that the recent paper you sent me uh, uh, by Phoebe uh, Lamb et al. Uh, uh, showing uh, you know, iron sulfide at uh, station five near the bottom. Yeah. Yep. So there's yep. sulfide. That station is on the continental shelf. So uh -huh. it's a really different chemical environment. Um, but yeah, we, well, we can. So, so it doesn't come from the, uh, the plume? Correct. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's before the plume. Mm -hmm. It's upstream. Thanks for reminding me about that, though. Um, when sulfides are there, we find them with the microprobe. All right, uh, Carolyn Pierce, last question. Thanks, Brendy. I was just wondering, um, in the experiments that you're doing in the, the lab, how do you stabilize that proto-ferrihydrate? Oh, well, uh, we're just, I have a new NASA grant where we're just starting to do this kind of work. Um, but luckily for us, there's been folks working on this for many years. And, you know, the oxyanions of phosphorus and arsenic, vanadium, they all do this. Um, and, and also small um, organic molecules. So there's a, um, silicic acid. There's lots of ways to um, interrupt the precipitation of these materials at different um, stages. And there's some really great older XFs papers that demonstrate how this works. Thank you. So we'll follow in their footsteps, I think is the plan.